Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so we've spent some time talking about steering. So remember, a uh, steering algorithm um, is meant to be applied uh, to control it over a short distances, over a short period of time, uh, to move an AI-controlled um, object somewhere through the game world. Typically, you're moving things in uh, a short distance. Um, and typically, there's nothing in between your starting point and where you're moving to. There might be some other... Um, other small objects in the world, uh, and so you have to steer around them to avoid them. You might have walls, and so in your steering algorithm, you also have to avoid colliding into the walls. But what the steering algorithms don't try to do is they don't try to move you from one point in the world to some other arbitrary point in the world. Uh, and so to solve that problem, that's the called the pathing problem, or it's actually a family of problems. Um, and that's what we want to look at in the next series of lectures. Uh, and so we looked at steering a little bit, Pathing is concerned with finding the best route from a location A to a location B. Uh, there's variations on this problem. So you can start at a location A and you might want to know uh, what is a path to many different locations. So B would not be a single location, but it would be a set of locations. And you might be interested in the reverse problem. So there's a whole bunch of locations in the world and you want to know how can you move from those locations to a single point. Uh, and finally, there is you have multiple starting points and multiple goal points, how do you move between them? Right? And so there's many variations of the pathing problem. We're mostly concerned with single, so A is a single point and B is a single point, um, at least uh, in the lectures uh, that I plan to talk, uh, the, the, in the planned lectures. Okay, so we're interested in pathing uh, right now. So here's, um, I have to jump out because this doesn't play in PowerPoint. This is, um, uh, an example from an older game, Neverwinter Nights, that illustrates the problem. Um, so I have to go out to, sorry, I need to go out to here. Uh, here, please. Thank you. Uh, all right, so here we've got a, uh, this character is actually under control of the, of the player, and they are clicking and pointing in the world to move the player, uh, to move the player, uh, sorry, to move the character through the world. Uh, and so notice when they're doing it, um, this one, uh, you're limited to the, the space of the screen in which you can click. Um, but especially at the beginning, uh, you notice that when they clicked um, on the other side of the house, the character had to steer, uh, had to find a path around the house, right? And in more general, you might, they, you might have to plan a path across a very large distance, right? And so there's things in the world uh, there's different types of terrain um, that you have to, uh, that you may want to avoid. Um, uh, equivalently, you might want to uh, force the object to move across certain types of terrain. Okay, so the mobile agent or the, uh, the game object under control by the AI has a task of moving from one location to another in the world. Right? And pathing is the problem of finding not necessarily the best route, but a route between the two points. Right? You're not, you don't always care about the best one. You just need to get this thing from here to there any which way you can. Um, so uh, the, the game object might be under control of the AI itself, or it might be under control of the player, um, but the player doesn't actually control exactly where it moves. It only, the player only controls the start point and the end, well, the end point, sorry. So they click somewhere in the world and uh, the AI t takes over and actually moves um, the player through the world. Okay, so there's lots of examples of this, right? So most, uh, many modern video games um, have some sort of NPC, so in this case villagers in the Age of Empires that repeatedly perform a task or perform some tasks. They're doing something, right? They're moving in around the world, right? In Age of Empires, you've got um, workers that are going and, and collecting resources for you. Right, so this villager is assigned to collect wood, so they have to go out to the forest, chop some trees, and come back. So the AI needs to pl pan, plan a path for the villager to move from their start point to the forest, and then from the forest back to the wherever they deposit the wood, I guess. Right. Um, as the AI is planning this, uh, it needs to uh, avoid um, impassable areas, right? So you don't want the villager to walk out into the lake and drown, right? Um, and things like that. You, you might not want to make them cross over the mountains because it'll take too long and so on and so on and so forth. Right. 
Okay, so there are some common algorithms for solving these types of problems. Um, if you've done any research on gaming on your own, you've almost certainly come across HDAR. Uh, that is probably the most common path planning algorithm that you hear about, at least in games. Um, which is funny because there are algorithms um, that are better than A star. It's just that everybody knows about A star and so they don't use them. So we'll talk about these other, well actually you'll have a reading assigned for one of the algorithms uh, that in fact plans, uh, p t tends to produce better paths than A star. Uh, we're going to start out by talking about this algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, you may have come across something called the wavefront algorithm or breadth first search. Uh, it turns out these are both just special cases of Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, the similar kinds of problems also appear in uh, robotics and in um, uh, AI-controlled vehicles. Uh, so your, the dream of having an AI-controlled car is that the car drives itself, right? It needs to solve a pathing problem, right? Fire up Google Maps, I need to get from Kingston to Toronto, right? And I'd like my car to take me there itself. It has to figure out uh, the path that takes it uh, from Kingston to Toronto. Hopefully staying on the roads, maybe avoiding tolls and doing all sorts of other things. Right, and so the planning problems come up all over the place. It's not, uh, they're not just limited to, um, to games. So let's start talking about Dijkstra's algorithm. This is uh, from the 50s, I think. So in the very early days of computing, um, someone was actually thinking about these kinds of problems. They were, uh, he was thinking about this in the context of, I think, um, taking uh, a trip. Um, the, uh, I think flying. So he, he wanted to, he, the idea was he wanted to give an example of a computing, pro of a problem that computing could be, uh, could be used in everyday life. And so he came up with this idea of how do you plan um, a trip uh, or a plane, a plane trip uh, connecting two different cities. Okay, so uh, Dijkstra's algorithm will find an optimal path. That is, it finds a path having the lowest cost. So it's guaranteed to find an optimal path. Um, Dijkstra's algorithm can account for uh, different types of terrain. All that means is that when you move from one point to another point, um, it can have a variable cost, right? So moving from A to B costs, say, one, whatever your cost is, whatever units your cost are in. Moving from A to C costs 12, right? And so Dijkstra's algorithm can handle those types of situations. So for games, this might be uh, if you're trying to plan a path that might cross different types of terrain, right? So going through a swamp is more expensive than going across open ground. Right? Uh, one of the problems with Dijkstra's algorithm is it's computationally expensive. You typically don't want to do this uh, on a large map um, in, uh, repeatedly. Right? So if you're trying to do this for lots and lots and lots and lots of game objects and your map is pretty large, uh, you probably don't want to use Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay, so here's the, uh, we're going to show you a picture first, uh, then we'll explain the algorithm in detail, uh, and then we'll give you more examples. So in the picture here, it's on a grid. So uh, we're going to start at this green square. We want to get to the orange square. Um, the rules of this, uh, the rules of traversal are that you can only go up and down, left and right. So this is a four connected grid, right? It easily generates, uh, generalizes to an eight connected grid. So there's nothing special about the four connectivity here. I'd like to find the shortest path from here to here. So the way Dijkstra's algorithm works is you start at the green square, right? And you consider all of its neighbors, right? So it's four neighbors here, 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 and here. And you ask yourself, how much does it cost to move from the starting square to uh, each one of the neighboring squares, right? So if we move from here to here, we're going to say it costs one because that's just the distance that you move. Whoop, like that. So to move to each one of those squares, uh, each one of those squares, it costs one unit of whatever, right? And we're now done processing the starting square. Uh, and so now you move out and you say, well, I've got a one here, right? If I'm uh, at this square here, how much does it cost to visit all of its neighbors, right? And so to move from this one to its neighbor here costs another one. So the total cost is two, right? So you consider the cost here and add the cost of the next step. Right. Similarly, if I'm here and I go up, that costs one more. So to get to this square, it costs me two. Right. And from here to here also costs me two. Right. And I'm now done processing that one. Right. And now you go back to, you go to the next one. Right. I've already figured out the cost for this square, so I don't have to do it again. 
right? To get to here, it costs one, and to go to here, it costs another one, right? And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? And so now you've got a bunch of twos. And so the cost, uh, so you can see that the squares are being labeled with the number of steps you need to get to that square, right? And you do the same thing for the twos, and now you get all the threes, right? And you just keep on going, right? So four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Now, depending on how you've implemented the algorithm, when you reach the goal, you can stop. If you like, you can keep on going, though, and compute the cost to any square in the grid, right? So you can keep on filling this in, fill in all the nines and all the tens and all the elevens and so on and so on and so forth, right? Uh, if you're interested in getting, if the only problem you're interested in is getting from the start to the goal, you can stop at this point, right? You've reached the goal square, and you know that it costs eight units to get there. Right. Once you've got, uh, once you've reached the goal, it's easy to get back to the, to, to uh, extract the path, right? You start at the goal and you just work backwards, right? So you can move to any seven connected to the eight. It doesn't matter which, right? So I can go left or I can go up. It doesn't matter. It's going to produce a path of equal cost, right? So I go to the seven. Now I go to the uh, six, any six connected to the seven. So I can go up or I can go left. It doesn't matter, right? So six. At the six, you go to any five connected to the six, so five, and then four, then three, then two, then one, right? You could also go this way, so seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, right? It's, the, it's a path of the same length. You could have gone this way, right? You could go eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, right? They're all valid paths, and they all cost the same amount, right? So this one finds multiple paths. Uh, it finds all paths connecting the start and goal point. Uh, sorry, it finds all shortest paths connecting the, the goal and start. Okay, so this is the um, algorithm uh, that Dr. Graham wrote. Um, I guess he wrote it this way um, to give you uh, to make it easy to read. Um, but when you write it this way, it's very deceptive because this isn't the way the algorithm is actually implemented. Right, and so a better description um, is actually the Wikipedia page. Sorry, not a better, a more complete implementation, a description of this algorithm is here. Uh, so Dijkstra's algorithm that I showed you, I showed you on a grid, but really uh, it was originally designed for graphs, right? But now you can imagine the grid as just being a graph, right? Where each grid location is connected to one of its four neighbors. Um, the nice thing about Dijkstra's algorithm is that because it works on graphs, your map doesn't have to be stored as a grid. It can be stored as a graph instead. And I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Right? So the way this actually works is, Right, you start out with your grid, so that's my graph. Right, wherever you see graph, just imagine grid. Right, wherever you see vertex, just imagine grid location. Right, so for every grid location v in my grid, right, I'm going to keep a. This looks like a, an array or a list. It's actually a map. Right, this is a map or a dictionary. So it's an associative array. Um, so for every vertex, I'm going to compute. Uh, I'm going to store its distance to the uh, start to the start. So it looks like an array, we can imagine it's an array. I'm going to set all the distances to infinity, right? Uh, previous is, uh, in this case, it's also uh, an associative map, uh, or associative array, sorry, map, dictionary, whatever you want to call it, right? And it records how did I get, what is the grid location that led me to this location V here, right? And so at the start, I don't know how to get to any particular location, so there, those are all set to null. Right? And now I add the grid location to uh, this thing they call Q. So here, Q isn't actually a Q. It's just a set or an array. It doesn't matter. Right? Um, they call it Q here because a better version of this algorithm actually uses a priority Q. Right? Okay, so the distance to the source, we know. Right? If I'm at the source location, then the distance to get the source is zero. Right? And so now you start to pluck, uh, you start to take um, no uh, grid locations out of the queue, right? So our queue, oh, sorry, out of out of queue. Queue only has the start location in it so far, so it's not empty. Right? So I look in the queue and I look for the um, the grid location that has the minimum distance, right? There's only one thing in the queue, so I take out the starting location, right? That's the next step removed from queue. You can sort of uh, from that line there, you can sort of guess at what the better implementation of this is, right? You want to find the vertex with the minimum distance. So you want to look through the, all the vertices that are in the queue. Sorry, all those grid locations in the queue. You want to find the one that has the shortest distance, right? If queue is a priority queue, 
uh, a minimum priority queue, then you know what uh, you know what the uh, grid location is with the smallest uh, distance, right? It's just the thing at the front of the queue. Uh, so that's a big hint. You probably want to use a priority queue here, right? Otherwise, you have to search a linear structure, and that's O of n, right? Okay. So for every neighbor of that thing that you just took out of the um, out of the uh, set queue, right? You want to compute its cost, just like I showed you, right? So the cost to get to this next location is the cost to get to the location plus the cost to take the next step, right? That's what the next step is graph edges UV, right? For us, that's just one, right? So that's the cost to take the next step. So that's just going to be one, right? And if the cost that you compute here is less than the cost that's currently stored in disk, update the value in disk and away you go. Right. And so that's the way you actually implement it. So underneath the hood, there really is a data structure that's storing uh, the values um, in the, that's storing the active uh, or the unprocessed elements in the, uh, gr uh, the unprocessed grid locations. Right. If you scroll further down, you'll see the improved version of the algorithm, right? Uh, but to get from this to this is a pretty big jump. <laughs> so, um, so that's why I thought it was important to uh, show you the Wikipedia page, right? Okay, so what is the cost of Dijkstra's algorithm? Well, it basically you're evaluating the cost at every point in the grid, right? And so if your grid has uh, n rows and m columns, it's O n times m, right? Assuming you can get to grid locations efficiently, right, in O one time. All right, so what happens when you have an obstacle um, on your um, in your map? So here we've got start location. Goal location, the black um, squares are, uh, I guess, walls or some kind of obstacle, some sort of impassable obstacle, right? So all you do is uh, you give a cost to trying to traverse the obstacle, right? And so you can give it a cost of infinity to indicate that you can't actually tra traverse the obstacle, right? And so that's nice. So starting at the start location, right? You consider, so we put this into the queue, right? Extract it from the queue, look at all of its neighbors, right? So that costs one to get to all of the neighbors, right? We're now done processing the thing in green. The ones are now in the queue, right? Pick the smallest element out of the queue. They're all ones, so it doesn't matter which one you take, right? Compute the cost of visiting all of its neighbors. So that gives you the twos, except for this one down here, right? So when you compute the cost of visiting that neighbor, that's infinity. So, um, or some large number, right? So uh, the cost of getting to this square um, is prohibitively large, right? So now we're done processing all the ones, right? So they get taken out of the queue. We've got a bunch of twos in the queue. We want to find the square, with the grid location with the smallest value. They're all two. So you process all the twos, right? You get a bunch of threes, right? Notice when you process this two here, when you hit the wall, it's infinite. It's infinite. So you can't, uh, so you assign a cost of infinity there. Right. Find the smallest, um, all the twos are now processed, right? So they all come out of the queue. Now process the next smallest item. It's all the threes. So process all the threes, right? Now all of the fours, right? Then all of the fives, all of the sixes, sevens, eights, nines, right? And eventually you get to the, the goal location and you get a 10. Right? So once you get the 10, you can either stop if this is all that you care about. If you want to work out the path, you just start at the 10 and you go backwards uh, until you get to the goal, right? So 10 to the 9, to the 8, to the 7, to the uh, goal location, to the start location there. And so here, there's only one unique uh, smallest, shortest, smallest cost path, right? And it's guaranteed to be the smallest cost path. Okay, so what happens if you have different types of terrain or if the cost of taking a step um, isn't one? Right, so here I've got another map. Again, green, start location, orange, stop location. Anything in gray has a cost of two instead of a cost of one, right? So if I want to step from this square to this square, it's gonna cost me two. If I wanna go from this square to this square, it's gonna cost me two, right? Anything in black is infinite again. Right. So start at the beginning, right? Take that, uh, take that grid location out of the queue, process its neighbors, so I get one. Right. We're done processing the square in green. I need to pick the smallest uh, costing square. They're all ones, so it doesn't matter which one I pick. Right. Update them all. Right. So this is where the algorithm now changes. Right. Notice that to go from the one to this square here is three. 
So in the next round of processing, I'm going to process the twos. I'm not going to process the three. Right? You want to process, uh, process them in smallest cost order. So I'm going to process all of the twos. Right? When I process this two, to cross into the gray square, it's now going to cost me an extra two, so that's four. Right? And now I can process all the threes. Like that. When this three moves to this square, when the, you move from this square to this square, it costs you an extra two, so that's going to cost me five now, right? When you move from here into the gray again, that's going to cost you five, uh, an extra two, sorry, so for the total cost of five, right? Now process all the fours, right? And then all the fives, and eventually you end up at this picture here, uh, assuming I actually did everything right, right? I did this all by hand, so it's possible I screwed something up, right? Uh, and eventually you end up reaching the goal location with a total cost of 19. Right? Again, to get back to the goal, uh, sorry, to get back to the start location, simply start at the 19 uh, and choose any path where the uh, next square costs one less. Right? So for example, I can go this way, 12. Uh, now I want to go down. So the cost is always decreasing. So I go to the 10, then the 8, then the 7, then the 6 to the 1. Right? So there's a valid path. Right? If I go the other way, that's fine. We can go to the 15, then the 14, the 13, the 12, the 10, the 9. We can go this way like that. Right, you could also, at the nine, you could go up to the eight, right? And when you get to the eight, your only choice is to go to the seven, so now you go this way. No. Right, and so that's Dijkstra's algorithm. Notice that to solve this particular problem, we had to, uh, we basically had to evaluate almost every grid location, right? So it's uh, O-N squared in this case. If you click on that link there, there's a nice little um, tutorial, um, a YouTube tutorial. Um, developed, I don't know who they are exactly, um, but there's a nice little tutorial that shows you the difference between Dijkstra's algorithm um, and something called the wavefront algorithm. Okay, the Dijkstra's algorithm is kind of expensive. So um, in many games, it's not important that you find the shortest path, you just want to find a path. Path might not be very good, but you want, but you want to be able to compute it quickly most of the time. Right? And so uh, one of the ways you can do this is with this thing called greedy best first search. Greedy best first search. Right? And so the way this thing works is, oh, so, sorry, let me go back. Notice that in Dijkstra's algorithm, uh, we never use any information about the goal. Right? I know I'm here. Right? I know the goal is here. Right? Other than the fact that the goal is here, you never process any information about your current location relative to the goal. So for example, if you are here, right, and you know the goal is over here, intuitively it makes sense, maybe I just want to start heading in this direction, right? So in other words, maybe I just want to head in the direction towards the goal. And so the question is, is can you develop an algorithm that uses uh, information like of this type, right? And so information of that type is called a heuristic, right? And so a heuristic is a rule of thumb or a guess or something like that, right? Uh, that you use to decide among several alternate courses of action, right? So in the path planning problem on a grid, at every point, you've got a choice of going, sorry, in one of four different directions, sorry. You've got a choice of going in, uh, from, okay. At every grid location, you've got a choice of going in one of four different directions, right? Dijkstra's algorithm tries them all, Right? Common sense says, hey, there's probably no point in looking in this direction, right? I probably don't need to evaluate the cost of going this way because it's headed directly away from the goal, right? Now, of course, it may turn out to be the case that, in fact, you want to go backwards before you can go forwards to produce the smallest path, right? But you might guess or use a heuristic and say, hey, look, I'm going to head in the direction that is the shortest path to the goal. So uh, in these pathfinding problems, the heuristic is just a function that you can evaluate, right? So it's typically called H of N, right? N is your node or your grid location, right? And all H of N does is it gives you an estimate of how much it's gonna cost to get to the goal, right? It doesn't have to be a good estimate, it just has to be an estimate of some kind, right? So H of N is just a guess as the cost of getting from the current node to the goal, goal node. Right? And so, for example, the simplest way to do this is to use the distance between your current location and the goal node, ignoring uh, terrain and impassable barriers. Right? So all you care about is the distance. You don't care if there's anything in between. Right? That's why it's a heuristic. Right? 
it doesn't give you the true cost because the true cost might involve having to navigate around. Right? Okay, so it's called greedy because we're always going to move in the uh, direction that reduces the cost. Right? Or sorry, we're, gonna, we're always going to move in the direction that produces the smallest cost to get to the goal. Sometime the cost is going to go up, as we'll see in just a second. All right, so here's greedy best for research. Again, uh, so it's an empty grid. We're gonna start here. We're gonna try to go here. Right, so uh, it works in a similar way. Right? I'm gonna start here. I'm gonna evaluate the cost of all my neighbors. Sorry, uh, I'm gonna use a heuristic. So, um, sorry, no, that's not true. I'm gonna evaluate, I'm gonna go to this, each neighbor, and I'm gonna calculate how far is that neighbor from the goal, right? In terms of number of steps you have to take. Right, so for this square here, right, I'd have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So my heuristic value for this square here is going to be seven. I'm gonna do the same thing for this square here, right? So how much is it, how, what is the distance between this point and the goal, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Uh, the distance I'm calculating here is called the city block distance or the Manhattan distance, right? So it's the distance on the grid. It's not the Euclidean distance, right? The Euclidean distance would be the distance between here and here in a straight line. You could also use the Euclidean distance if you wanted to. Right? The heuristic value here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I get nine here, nine here, seven here, and seven here, right? It's called greedy best search search. So that you're gonna move in the direction that is the smallest right, has the smallest heuristic value. So I can pick this square here or this square here, right? I'm gonna move to this square here arbitrarily. Now you repeat the process, right? Evaluate the heuristic for every square that you haven't been on already. So I've already, I've already been here. I need to evaluate it here, here, and here, right? It turns out it's uh, five and six are the values, right? So if you're here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, sorry, it's eight, right? Um, here it's six and here at six, right? So you can pick, it's greedy, move in the direction that has the smallest heuristic cost, right? So I'm gonna arbitrarily go there. Right? And rinse and repeat, and you can end up with a path that looks like that. This isn't the only path, right? But this is the one that uh, Nick drew, so it's the one I'm using, right? Eventually you get to here, your cost is one, and now you're right beside the goal, so you're done, right? So there's an example of greedy best for a search. Now, what does it do on a more complicated map like this? Okay, so starting here, right, I'm gonna evaluate the heuristic cost of all of my neighbors. I'm gonna ignore all the terrain, right? So the cost of here is one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. It's seven here as well, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it's nine and nine there. So I'm gonna fill in the heuristic cost. Right? Okay, it's greedy. So. Move in, uh, move in a direction, uh, or move to a square that's uh, that with the smallest cost, the smallest heuristic cost. Right, so I can pick either one of the sevens. I'm going to choose the bottom one, and I'm going to repeat the process. Right? Evaluate the heuristic cost for all of your neighbors. Here it's infinity. I didn't label it, right? But here it's infinity because it's a wall, right? And so now I've got an eight and a six, right? So. It's greedy, move to the square with the smallest heuristic cost. So we're gonna go to the six, repeat the process, right? Now there's only one square that I haven't visited yet. So I only need to evaluate the heuristic function once it's five, right? So one, two, three, four, five. So we're gonna process the five next. That gives us the six, right? Uh, I've already visited here, so I'm not gonna process that again. So there's only one thing labeled six and that's the smallest one. So I have to evaluate that one. Right, and now there's a seven and a five. Five's the smallest, so I'm gonna evaluate it. There's a six, right? So here's the six here, uh, so that's the smallest value, so I have to evaluate it. It has no neighbors that we haven't visited yet, so we don't have to do any work when we get here. Uh, but now we've got two sevens, and so now we have to pick a seven to go to. Right, so I'm gonna go to that one. Right. We're at the seven here, I've got eight, eight, and I have a seven here. Right, and so now I expand the seven, right? That seven, uh, why is that colored in eight? So that should be black now. 
I don't have to evaluate anything here. That was previously evaluated, so I don't have to reevaluate it. Right? And so now I've got three eighths. Okay, pick one of them. I'm going to expand that one. I've got some nines and I've got some eights. So now I have to pick an eight. Right? Pick that one, nothing to do, right? Because uh, all the neighbors are already evaluated. Right? Pick the next one. Right? So that expand so that eight ha now has a nine here. And now I've got four nines and a nine. So pick any one of them at rent, pick any one of them and expand. Right? There's a 10, there's an 8, there's a 9, so obviously I'm going to expand the 8, and now it finds a path out. Right? And so here we've got, uh, we've got our, uh, that, everything is shown in green, that's all of the squares that were evaluated uh, to get to the goal location. Right? Uh, so if you look again on Wikipedia, best first search, the best first search. Right, so this is the GBS or greedy best first, first search algorithm, right? Uh, if you actually look at the code, it looks a lot like Dijkstra's algorithm, and that's because it is. It does. It is a lot like Dijkstra's algorithm, right? Um, and it does more or less the same thing, right? You put things into a queue, you take them out of, out of the queue as you visit them. The difference here is that the algorithm, as written, it doesn't keep track of the path, right? And so if you actually want to extract the path from this thing. Right, what you actually need to do a little bit more work. So the easiest way to deal with this is to remember how did I get to this one, right? Well, I came from this two, right? And how did I get to this two? Well, I came from this three, right? And if you go all the way back to the nine, you came from this eight, right? And you came from this seven, right? And you came from the six, five. So notice you can't do the same thing that you did with Dijkstra's algorithm, right? So here, if I follow the path back, always trying to decrease the cost, right? Notice, uh, oh, sorry, always trying to increase the uh, cost, right? I get to the nine and suddenly the cost goes down, right? So I can't just follow the path back that where the cost always goes up by one. That doesn't work anymore. So you actually do need to keep track of how you get uh, from node to node, right? And if you do that, you can figure out that the path that this produced was here, 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 like uh, that, right? Um, and so that produces uh, your path there, right? Notice that this, um, explores much less of the grid than Dijkstra's algorithm would, right? Dijkstra's algorithm would explore everything up to here, right? So all of this stuff, right? And this explores much less. So in the worst case, you can still make this be uh, n squared, well, n, n, n rows time. If you have n rows, m columns, you can still make this O, n, n in the worst case, right? But most of the time, it's closer to the length of the optimal, well, closer to the length of uh, the uh, optimal path, right? So it's almost linear in most cases, which is much better than n squared, right? Uh, the problem is though, is it can produce, uh, it doesn't produce the minimum cost path, right? The minimum cost path in this case, right? If you were here, you would just go around like that, right? Here, you've got to take this winding path uh, like that. So, um, uh, the greedy best for research doesn't produce the best uh, path, but it produces it pretty quick. It produces a path most of the time pretty quickly. Okay, so everything I've shown you works on a grid. Now the question is, is well, what if you don't want a grid, <coughs> right? So suppose you've got a world that looks something like this, right? So you could store this map as a grid, right? And now you can just run Dijkstra's algorithm or, um, sorry, Dijkstra's algorithm or greedy best for search on this grid, right? Not worry about it. Uh, now the problem with this is if your world's very big uh, and your grid is very dense, uh, it takes a long time to run these algorithms, right? Your grid becomes very large um, and that's no good, right? If a lot of these spaces are just wide open, right, then you don't really care about moving on the grid locations, you just care about traversing this map, right? You can store a reduced version of your map, right, as a graph, right? And so instead of storing all the grid locations for this square up here, I can store a single vertex of a graph, right, and say this is a point in this uh, room or whatever is here, right? Similarly, I can store a point down here or somewhere else, it doesn't matter, right? And I can store a point here and I can store a point here, right? This graph is much smaller than this graph, right? M many fewer vertices, many fewer edges, 
Uh, and so many video games will store their um, map, right, uh, in some form that looks like a graph, in something that looks like a graph like this, right? And now to plan a path from here to, say, over here, right, you only have to consider a small number of nodes or vertices uh, to get to the goal location over here, right? Rather than having to consider every grid location here, right? And there's lots of variations that you can do with this. Right? Instead of storing this grid here, you can store a coarser grid instead. Right? If you still like grids, store a coarser grid. Right? So for example, up here, I don't need to store uh, all nine locations. Right? If I wanted a grid, I could just put in four for the four corners of that, uh, uh, of that square up there. Right? And so for this one here, I can just put in four and probably one for the door um, or something like that. Right? And so you can do adaptive size grids, uh, you can do very coarse grids, right? you can do graphs, and you can do all sorts of other things, right? Whatever makes the most sense for the game that you're um, uh, trying to plan. Right? If you use a coarse grid like this, right, you probably don't want to move from grid location, sorry, from uh, vertex to vertex, right? Your motion's probably gonna be a little unusual, right? But that's what your steering algorithms are for, right? You can use these as waypoints. Uh, and so you can tell your character, hey, move to this point over here, knowing that there's nothing in between, or, or there might be AI characters in between. You can use a collision avoidance algorithm to get around them, right? And steer from here to here, right? It'll take some path uh, from there to there, and then steer to here to here, and here to here, and so on and so on and so forth. Okay, if you're planning stuff on a grid, uh, some of the disadvantages with planning on a grid is that uh, your path is limited to the grid locations. So you're planning on here, basically your path that produces is always moving from square to square to square, right? If you allow diagonal motion, that produces slightly better looking, um, uh, that produces slightly smoother paths, right? Ideally, uh, though, you would like to be able to move from this location, this grid location to this grid location um, in any direction, right? So if I start at the center, it might be nice if I can move to the upper right-hand corner of this grid location. Right. Uh, the basic algorithms, so Dijkstra's algorithm doesn't let you do that. Greedy best for research doesn't let you do that. You need some variation, uh, or you need a different algorithm in order to um, plan a path uh, that doesn't go from the center of a grid location to the center of a next grid location. But we will look at that in, well, we won't quite look at that in the next lecture. So the next lecture, we'll look at A star. We'll talk about some of the mathematical properties of A star. Uh, and then in the lecture after, well, lecture probably two after that, um, we'll look at some more advanced algorithms uh, that let you plan smooth paths through grid-like environments. All right, that's all I got for you today. Um, any questions? Great, so we're done for today, done for this week, I guess. Um, I'll see you next week.